Welcome to Franchise Marketing Radio, brought to you by SEO Samba, comprehensive high-performing marketing solutions for mature and emerging franchise brands. To supercharge your franchise marketing, go to seosamba.com. That's S-E-O-S-A-M-B-A dot com. Welcome to Franchise Marketing Radio. Stone Payton, Lee Cantor here with you this morning. Lee, this is going to be a fantastic segment. Today's episode brought to you in part by the Business Radio X Studio Partner Program, equipping franchisors to help their franchisees dominate their local market. To learn more about serving your market and growing your business, go to mybrxstudio.com. On today's episode, we have with us the CEO with Bloom and Blinds, Mr. Kelsey Stewart. Good morning, sir. Good morning, guys. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Well, Kelsey, before we get too far into things, can you share a little bit about Bloom and Blinds? How are you serving folks? You bet. So we are a full-service blind company. Uh, by that, I mean we sell and install virtually every kind of window covering product that's out there. Uh, but we also offer a unique niche in the industry in the fact that we uh, have a full service repair ability as well uh, and as a mobile service. So we are we're able to sell anything you're looking for. But then regardless of who put it in or how old it is, we can actually help fix them if they wear out or the dog eats it or somebody falls through it at a Christmas party. Now, how did the business start? Was it um, an individual location that grew and somebody said, hey, we should probably franchise this? Or what's the history, the backstory? So without trying to get too long in it, so uh, we're a family company. My mom started Bloom and Blinds. Uh, actually, there is an original version prior to that um, uh, in Seattle. We're now in Dallas. Um, but it was originally a family blind company without any grand ambitions, just trying to you know make a living like everyone else. And we recognized that uh, we we had a, a nose for technology, and so we could separate ourselves that way. And then we had this repair component that no one else offered in the Dallas market. And we very quietly became one of the largest blind companies in Dallas. And wanting to be more than just the owner operator, um, we explored the idea of building you know company stores in other cities uh, or franchising. And ultimately chose to franchise because we didn't want to break up the family unit. Uh, Bloom and Blinds is ran by my my two younger brothers and then my mom, who uh, started the whole thing, now retired. But um, we didn't want to break that up uh, and fracture into other cities, so we decided to franchise. So, so when you were drawing up the the pros and cons, you were part of it was hey we can kind of grow ourselves as much as we can grow, but at some point we can kind of just take this systems that we build and the processes that we have and then help other people kind of be the bloom and blinds folks in whatever market they're in. Yeah. We, we've always had a heart to be uh, as teachers, uh, whether it's, you know, just friends, family, other businesses, we've always been a family that was really into communication and teaching people interesting parts of our world. So it was a, as a franchising was a natural extension for us uh, simply because now I get to teach people what I know how to do. Um, it's also, you know, a fantastic way to multiply yourself. Uh, and, and that's our struggle for every entrepreneur is, you know, how to, how to multiply your efforts and not have to do everything yourself. Now, how was it kind of making the transition from every day you're just trying to get new blinds clients to every day now you're kind of trying to transfer this knowledge to other people in different markets? That's been a real interesting journey. We have been a franchise for right about five years. Um, and the first two and a half years, we were building the franchise while still operating the local Dallas business. Um we got into franchising assuming uh, that we would just be doing what we already knew and come to learn that, you know, running a blind company and franchising are two totally different industries. It's not apples and oranges. It's apples and orangutans. Right. <laughs> so, we, so the learning curve was pretty steep in terms of like, uh, you know, wow, I had no idea I needed to worry about that or that I needed to pay attention to this or that states need registration we really kind of got into franchising with a very limited scope 
and have had to work very quickly to get ourselves uh, up to speed and make sure that, that the business is built the right way. Now, do you remember that time you got your first franchisee? I do. Uh, it took from the, from the time that we had our FDD published to the time that uh, the first person said yes and signed took all, almost six months on the dot. And we had three within th- uh, three weeks of that first one. So and then, it was, when once, that, when once that, it started to happen, it happened really quick. Now, once you had that person and now the company, you know, the whole time you're like, okay, we're building Dallas and then we're doing this too. And now you have this person and now did the whole kind of mindset kind of shift. And now we got to make sure this person's successful. And now all your energy is kind of uh, aimed at this person, the first franchisee or the, now the franchisees are on a clock. Yeah, we, (laughs) we, again, that, that learning curve was so incredibly steep. Our first franchise owners are all still in business. The first 17, 18 of them are all still in business. Mm-hmm. And it can't possibly be because of the quality of training. Uh, we, <laughs> <laughs> the, it's, it's a testament to the business model. Uh, we were still operating like nine to five. We were still running 40, 50 hours a week. And we still had to sell blinds to be that 10 person office. And so when we had brought in a franchise owner, we literally just threw them in the van for three weeks and had them come right along with us on different, uh, different projects. And that was their training. Like it was all street smarts. There was no book knowledge. There was no real organized method to it. Um, and, and again, it wasn't until our 17th franchise owner where we started to pull ourselves out of the day-to-day operations of the Dallas office and actually began to develop and devote specific franchise training time. Um, so it, yeah, it, that, that whole process where like all of a sudden we've got this responsibility of a franchise owner truth is for on the early side, we didn't stop what we were doing. We just made them come along with us. Right. Now, when you have them now, is the did, does that mean the persona has changed for that franchise owner? Is you know maybe you thought they were one type of person when you first started doing this, and now you know you're in with for five years. That maybe now that's kind of shifted a little, or has that stayed the same? Uh, no, it's definitely evolved. Um, I think overall, somebody drawn to a window covering business, especially one that throws in the wrinkle of a repair. Um, they're going to have to be someone who likes to tinker and who likes to use their hands and somebody who likes problem solving and uh, enjoys immediate gratification. So that part has, um, has stayed the same from a franchise level. Um, we are a bit of like, there's a reason that we're the franchise or not a franchisee. We are a family of entrepreneurs. And so we don't fit in a box or a cage very well cage isn't a nice word, but uh, you know, I've never heard this, someone use the word cage for that. I've heard yeah, box. Let's cut that out. Of the show, <laughs> shall we? Um, so at first we were drawn to those that were like and kind, and we brought in a ton of free thinking, open-minded individuals, and we built the franchise early that way. And those people really loved it because they got the name and the support and the buying power, but then they didn't really have to follow a lot of rules. Mm-hmm. And as we've gotten bigger, we've realized that to create a solid structure and to protect everyone in the long run, you know, you've got to start to, you know, kind of rein in some of those uh, details. And so now we're, you know, now we're looking for people who have that ingenuity and that creativity, but also still really embrace a system and an organization and people who aren't trying to rewrite the, rewrite the book or reinvent the wheel. And, that's probably been one of the biggest shifts in terms of who we are attracted to as franchise candidates. Um, but that wasn't that yeah, they're, they're two different people for sure. Now is a, a person who runs a franchise is this, you mentioned that owner operator is important or tinkerer is important early on. Is it something that they can grow and um, kind of step out of and let other people run? Or is it something where you need the franchisee to be actively involved? It can grow to that level. Um, it's not, this is a business that starts owner operator. Um, window coverings are way more technical than anyone would ever imagine on the surface. That's a universal comment we get from franchise owners as they get in here. Um, 
So we, we want an owner operator start. The volumes are strong, but they're not so strong that an owner operator can't handle it inside of a 40 hour work week. Mm -hmm. So you can still have a lifestyle and a really nice business probably for the first two years. Um, then you start adding support people on the phone or a technician in the field. And most, most of our owners will probably stay where it's, you know, the owner maybe doing sales and administration, and then you add a salesperson and install and an office person and a, you know, that four person office could do a million dollars a year in revenue. Mm -hmm. Um, a handful of them are already showing the, the propensity to be a true empire builder. And those people might grow it similar to how we did in Dallas and be a multi-million dollar operation and have, you know, eight, 10 employees. But even then, mistakes are expensive enough that you, you really kind of still have to keep your hand on it. Otherwise, um, things can get out of control financially pretty quick if you're not careful. So now, so I, well, go ahead. I'm sorry. But now you go. I was simply going to say, I, I don't think this will ever, this isn't a good industry for an absentee owner. But if you scale it up, you can get yourself off the truck. You can stop swinging hammers and, and screwing in brackets. Um, but you're probably, you know, the top 20% will get to that level. Right. The rest of them will just have a, a, you know, a small team and a very light load for, you know, a pretty nice re return on investment. So now what is, um, so how do you differentiate yourself in, in the market? Like what is from the customer standpoint, the consumer um, in their house, how, how is this different than other blinds offerings? Mm -hmm. Main separator right off the bat is the fact that we do repairs. Um, it's kind of a, it's a thing in our industry that no one wants to do. Everyone loves the big numbers of selling new product and nobody wants to spend the time or the, uh, the knowledge to learn how to repair a blind regardless of which manufacturer it is and source the parts. We carry our parts with us everywhere we go. So that is a major differentiator as a consumer, but we see that people would prefer to buy from an all in one company versus a one trick pony. And then um, when, when you say all in one, so that means that if I buy bloom and blinds and if something happens to a bloom and blind, I can call them and then they can fix it as opposed to I go with, you know, ABC blind and, uh, you know, good luck finding somebody that's going to come and repair that or if they can find the part or whatever. So you're kind of vertically integrated, like, so that everything comes kind of the bloom and blinds way? Yeah, there's two scenarios where repair would become involved. Um, um, if the if we didn't sell it, then we are, aren't obligated to warranty it. If If it's a warranty item... Typically, the factories want the blind back in their in their building. They'll fix it at their leisure, two or three, four weeks. It takes a long time to get a blind repaired through the factory, and then it's got to be shipped back to the either the retailer or the homeowner. So the, the while it is a free repair, it's out of the window for quite a while. That's your master bathroom. That's a problem. It's gonna yeah. make a very awkward Fourth of July picnic, <laughs> or or your living room <laughs> with that big gap of <laughs> exactly window right. in the middle. Yeah like a set of bad teeth or something. <laughs> right. So, um, so on a warranty side, we hold an advantage because I can just put it on your kitchen counter and fix it. And if it's warranty, we'll do it for free. Now, the other side of the warranty is what happens when the homeowner causes the damage or it's a dog or there's some sort of, you know, kids with scissors and things. Um, that wouldn't be a free repair. But again, instead of sending it, instead of making you buy a new one or sending it to the factory for a month, I can just show up at your house and put it back together. But we can do that on the blinds that we install, and I can do it on blinds that I did not install. Wow. So if you're, yeah, so if you're in a house, you don't know who sold them, or you didn't like them, or you just, you know, forgot for whatever reason, or you didn't buy them, they were there when you got the house. If something breaks or wears out, then all, all our franchise owners can go to the house and fix it. We, on a generic level, we can fix about 95% of what we see. And so that's a huge separator. The other part is that we've infused a lot of technology and a lot of efficiencies to put on a better show. Truth be told, uh, our, our industry is fairly low, uh, low in, or not very interested in technology. And so by working on cloud-based systems and uh, sending email reminders and text reminders, we even have like a feature when we're on the way, like an Uber driver, mm -hmm. you can watch us drive to the house like an Uber driver. So we, we, we put on a heck of a show 
and that gives consumers confidence that we're a legitimate business, that we're worth our money, uh, and that they're they're well spent with us. Now, from a customer standpoint, is this is how many times are you buying blinds in your house? Is this like once every 10, 20 years, or how, how does that work? The resale? Yeah, it seems to, well, it resells every four to six years, you may make a new window covering purchase. It doesn't mean you're going to throw them all out, but maybe you change up one room, or maybe you've moved to a new house and they have a product that you don't want or you want to change something about it. Mm-hmm. But the average, the average new purchase is about every four to six years. The average repair purchase is about every two years. Right. So something's so happening. That so that gives you kind of a point of entry in there to keep the relationship going uh, where yep. most people aren't playing that game. They're, they're kind of just waiting for you to get new ones. Correct. Yeah. And that's the entire, I mean, we are literally the anomaly in the industry. 99 out of 100 blind companies only sell new products. Wow. So that, and did that happen? How did that, what was the origin of that? <laughs> so I'll try and make this quick. When, so used to live in Seattle. When uh, my brothers and I were in high school, my mom got an itch uh, for a new business as a serial entrepreneur. She bought a blind cleaning machine and um, thought she was going to rule the world by cleaning blinds. But every time somebody called her off her advertising, it was always to put blinds back together to a string wore out or something was bent or broken and she didn't really have any parts. She bought a cleaning machine. Right. And so she, so she started going to garage sales looking for blinds that people were getting rid of. And she would uh, somehow she managed to find those strip down the parts and she started using used parts to help put other people's stuff back together. Then eventually found a manufacturer who made blinds that would sell her individual pieces and now she had a, a ready supply of parts, fairly limited, but still at least had new parts to work with. And then as the repair and cleaning kind of took off, then the sales took off. But it, it, was, it wasn't it was by any sort of master plan. There was no business plan that had the word blind repair in there. Right. It was, <laughs> it was simply, hey, this sounds like a good idea. Let me do it in my garage. And then because she listened to the customers, they... They told her what they wanted, and she morphed the business to meet the customer demand. Wow. That's a great example of listening to the customer and then just adjusting to what their needs are, what they're telling you instead of what you necessarily had in mind originally. You bet. That's entirely what happened. And then has any of that thinking kind of been part of this transformation into a franchisor? Have you been listening to your franchisees? Have you made any adjustments based on what they're learning with boots on the ground in different markets? Yeah, it's um, we, we're still a small franchise. I mean, there's 45 active locations right now. And so one of our differentiators from a Jimmy John's or a Subway or uh, Anytime Fitness is that we're not some giant corporation that is full of, you know, 800 people in an office building. Um, we are intimately involved with our franchise owners feedback constantly coming back and forth. And it's still very much like a family business where we're, we're small enough that we are able to continue to maintain that culture. And so those franchise owners are constantly seeing what the consumers want and they're bringing that feedback to us, and we're either working with suppliers or software products or changing the vehicle wraps to make, try and be more catching. But uh, we are very, very much from a franchise over level still. And we're not on the ground, but we're with them. Uh, there's no separation of communication there. If you're just joining us, you're listening to Franchise Marketing Radio. Stone Peyton Lee Cantor here with you this morning, and we are visiting with the CEO of Bloomin' Blinds, Mr. Kelsey Stewart. Kelsey Stone here. Uh, a question about the marketing, maybe from a couple of different perspectives. One, from the franchisor perspective, have you found that there are some marketing vehicles, I don't know, uh, direct mail, email, pay-per-click, that are serving you better than others when it comes to getting the word out about your opportunity to potential franchisees? Are there some things that are working for you better than others in that regard? So I, 
probably more than anything, I can tell you what we've learned that doesn't work for us yet. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> so again, being a small company and bootstrapping this from our Dallas office and siphoning money out of that, you know, we didn't we didn't build this company with big pockets. And the one thing I have learned about franchising is that everything seems to have an extra zero. Everything <laughs> has yeah. an extra zero. <laughs> and so um, I have found I have found success in the portal marketing. So your sites like mm. Franchise Gator, Franchise.com, Franchise Direct, you know, places like that. Um, and even in that market, there's definitely a separation between the quality sites and the sites that will sell you a dead person as a lead. Um, so we've had to get good at that. And we've made real, real success out of that industry, which is generally the, the bottom feeder lead source for franchise marketing. Um, that's the one source that we can handle the uh, monthly expenses of. Um, and so while we are panning for gold in our in a stream. Uh, we have been able to find some some really nice, uh, important people to bring in the organization through that process. What I haven't found much favor in is spending money on pay per click. I've learned that you need to have a pretty massive budget if you're really going to make any headway uh, that way. I also learned uh, that the trade shows, like the uh, franchise trade shows where people come in and get look at different ideas. Like in the different markets, um, those expos where they all were a person in yeah, a given right, market. Yeah, the franchise account. expos. Right. You bet. You know, you pay your nine bucks, you come in, you look at 200 different companies and talk to whoever you want to. Um, we've done several of those and it was a ghost town in our booth because, and I, I don't know this for a fact, but my feeling about it is that we're not a very sexy industry, right? Like no one went to career day in high school and said, I'm going to be a blind guy. So, but not being in a sexy industry and then not being a name brand, you know, I'm not budget blinds. Uh, and for that, uh, we literally stood there for two days and talked to ourselves. Um, and those have been the, the pieces that we've tried that haven't been all that valuable. We did a little bit on the Facebook side, but again, you know, that's not where people generally go when they're looking for a franchise. Well, that's helpful the though. Bulk it's good to know go what's what works and what doesn't, right? I'm sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say that the one place that's consistently worked for us and is still our main marketing uh, avenue right now is working with the portals and just not treating those leads as the bottom option. It, it's treating them with you know diligence and respect and knowing that there are pieces of gold in there. You just have to you have to work for it. Yeah. All right. So now uh, it's the same kind of question, but from the franchisee uh, in their local market, are, are there some things that you are finding that are working really well for, for them? Yes. So being in the window covering space, or let's call it home services, because I think this applies to plumbers just as well as it does line companies. But there's this segment of home services that are need-based items. Right. Nobody needs a plumber until you need a plumber. <laughs> yeah. Nobody needs nobody needs a blind company until you are in the mood for blinds, whether it's a repair or new sales. Like you could go for years and not think of window coverings. So knowing that we're need based and knowing how myself and everyone else around me searches, we've really worked hard to dominate the internet. When we launch a new location or where current locations are. Uh, we're focused heavily on our own website and the SEO that goes into that, and then working through your paid lead generators like pay-per-click and Home Advisor, Yelp and Angie's List, and, and a handful of other places like that. Um, our average from the time that we launch a location and turn on the marketing, the average time for our phone to ring is less than 12 hours. Wow! And it's because it's because we've gotten really good at figuring out where our customers are and how they're searching, and. The, the three main buckets of this industry are either internet, referral, or repeat. And when you're a brand new location, you don't have referrals or repeats yet. So going to going to the internet and playing that game really, really well launches our guys really quickly. Um, online reviews are another source really focusing on that. My industry is asleep at the wheel. No one's paying attention to online reviews. So uh, we've got software that texts a request, and within that text, if you click about three different times, you're already in our review page. Wow. So we've made it really easy for our customers to leave reviews for us. 
Um, and so it's helping us outrun the competition, even though we're brand new in a city, uh, when you're looking at the reviews. So that's a competitive There's advantage a- for the franchisee when they come in and they know their phone's going to ring in 12 hours, uh, you know, from turning this thing on, that probably gives them a lot of confidence. Mm-hmm. I, we just, so we graduated a training class last Friday, um, and today we're Monday, and the owner in Fresno, California has already had five appointments. Uh, including yes. the one that was at nine o'clock this morning. Wow! So that so it, they get up and get they get up and get going pretty quick if you know how to play the game, right? And then that's the beauty of you having you know been in the trenches in Dallas. You've kind of paved the way for them because what what works in Dallas probably works pretty well anywhere else. Primarily, you're right, and it's primarily because most of our franchise owners are in major suburban markets. So marketing in small town USA is a little different and it's not as effective from the internet side and the volumes are lower, but we're primarily focusing on putting them in major suburban environments and people are people, you know, we all kind of, you know, work the same way for, for the most part. Um, that's the, those are the, some of the same techniques we use to build that Dallas office into 3 million a year. And so we're taking what we know and then what we continually learn through the owners in place and just constantly refining it to make sure our blade is as sharp as possible. So now, um, are there certain parts of the country that you're targeting right now, or is it kind of a free-for-all anywhere in the U.S.? If somebody's interested, you'll um, have a conversation with them. Uh, yeah, we're, we're looking to grow in all 50 states. Um, we're not looking for small markets. If you have 70,000 people around you, that's not enough. So we, our territories need to be two to Two to three to four hundred thousand people. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's an important part. We're registered in forty-nine out of the fifty states. We're just not registered in Hawaii at the point at this point. Mm-hmm. And um, and so anyone on the mainland, uh, we are excited to talk to, as long as they live in a population that is actually going to give them an opportunity. Even if you have a desire and a checkbook full of money, if you're in a town of seventy thousand people we can't award you a franchise because we would just be taking your money and you're going to struggle and fail. Right. It's just not, it's just not enough people because there's not window coverings is not whether it's a pair of sales, they're just not purchased that often that a small community can make decent money. Right. In order for them to be successful, they need certain population. I mean, right. That's just the way it is. And we, yeah, we've decided that we didn't want to worry about the conscience the conscience crisis of a money grab. So we have avoided from the very beginning, we've avoided those moments where like, I don't think they're going to make it, but they're willing to pay. So we, right. we have really tried to make sure that we don't have to worry about that in the long run. Well, if somebody wants to learn more about the franchise opportunity, is there a website? Yeah. Bloomin' Blinds franchise. It's like blooming, but there's no G on the end. Bloomin' Blinds franchise that's the franchise site. And then the consumer site is just bloomandblind.com, which of course has a link to the franchise website. Good stuff. Well, Kelsey, thank you so much for sharing your story today. My pleasure, guys. I really appreciate you having me on. All right. This is Lee Cantor for Stone Pit, and we will see you all next time on Franchise Marketing Radio.